One is that the threat perception system is enhanced so that people see danger where other people see manageable stuff. And this is not in the cognitive part of the brain, this is sort of the core percept perceptual part, the very primitive part of the brain. So the primitive part of the brain that basically is in charge of making sure that your body is okay uh, becomes a fear-driven brain. Um, so that's number one. Number two is that your filtering system a little higher up in your brain that helps you to distinguish between what is relevant right now and what you can dismiss gets messed up. So things that other people may sort of ignore or not pay attention to, you start paying attention to it, which makes it very hard to focus on what's going on right now. So you get in the whole, you get into the whole issue of being it being difficult to fully engage with ordinary situations. The third one is that the self-sensing system, which runs through that those midline structures of the brain that various people probably have talked about on your program already. Um, the midline structure that's devoted to your experience of yourself gets blunt. And that's probably a defensive response because when you are in a state of terror, you feel it in your body. You feel it in terms of heartache and gut-wrenching feelings. And so your body feels bad. And so as a way of coping with that, some people start taking drugs to sort of dampen that system. And other people sort of naturally find a way of dampening that internal response to yourself. But when you start dampening your response to yourself, you also dampen the response to pleasure, sensuality, excitement, connection, stuff like that. So it's very, very deep in, in the core organism of human beings. I moved to Ohio when I was eight years old because my father had passed away. He had uh, cancer and how my mom took it afterwards. Started to have a really bad drinking problem and started taking prescription medications all the time. As a kid, I was always afraid something was gonna happen. What if I told you your brain could be wired for danger before you even learn how to ride a bike? That everyday sounds, faces, and places could trigger fear responses before your mind even makes sense of them. Now imagine growing up like that, sensing threats in laughter, flinching at love, and numbing your joy just to survive. Why does this happen? And more importantly, can it ever be undone? Trauma doesn't just live in memory, it embeds itself in your brain's most primitive wiring. According to research, one in four children in the US is physically abused, and one in five is sexually abused before adulthood. These aren't just statistics, they're blueprints for how a child's world is shaped, and often shattered. In this episode, We'll explore how trauma hijacks the brain's core systems, distorting perception, dulling the self, and warping the ability to connect. We'll also hear from those who've lived it and discover how healing can begin, not with words, but with movement, safety, and reconnection. And it became a meme, which is an interesting thing to see. It's really that trauma is a visceral experience. What does that mean? Feel in your body, heartbreak and gut wrench. You stiffen up. 
you surrender, you lose your power, you tighten up. That's really where trauma is lived. Yeah. Good. But I do a lot of CBT with my wife, let's say. Yeah. I point out her irrational behavior <laughs> and that she should really see things from a different angle and that she should really see things correctly. And I really have much success with that. And I'm a bit surprised that psychology does things that most spouses have failed in using very well. So my approach is to really experience what your body feels and also uh, allowing your body to do things that it has been afraid to do and to explore how your body moves to the world in some ways. I think it's an intriguing question because it's not exclusively women. Of course, men have always done it in armies and basic training and the military. And uh, what's intriguing to me is that, uh, you know, when people join the military, they oftentimes they're not very well put together people, and they go through basic training, and they really march together, they sing with people, and they climb barricades, and they go through uh, composite physical experience with other people. At the end of 12 weeks, they feel competent, and they feel connected, and they have found a band of brothers. How do they do it? Not by yakking, but by having very deep shared physical experiences. Often, huh? Often. 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 <laughs> and we don't know how often that is, but I get to meet quite a few of them. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. But, you know, but those are the people who manage to get into my practice. Mm. And the people who don't find the solutions don't have the wherewithal and the capacity to make it into therapy with me. Mm. Getting drugs, lying on the streets, et cetera, et cetera. And to, to a large degree, I see that as, as an issue of accident. You know, I, this past year, I visited a program in Los Angeles called um, Homeboy Industries. It's a, it's a program for formerly incarcerated, largely Latin men who had no fathers, who have been criminals. And it's a spectacular program where they honor, they say, what do you need? How we can we take care of you? How can we make a safe, uh, safe place for you? And I saw a real treatment there, St. Quentin Hospital. Uh, St. Quentin Prison, famous prison in California, is now trauma-based. They use my book as a poor text there. And they're transforming people's lives by acknowledging the reality of what they dealt with, helping people to be part of the healing system, working in groups, working with movement. Um, like at St. Quentin, they have hula dancing classes. I go like, yeah! Moving together with other people gives you a sense of connection sense so of pleasure, uh, they, I begin, they're really beginning to understand you can do it. At the Harvard Hospital, you wouldn't do the hula with people, you wouldn't dance with people. <laughs> yeah, I think that's again a selection bias of people she works with. Uh, I know certainly plenty of people have had plenty of people working for me uh, who who really get paralyzed in the face of, of challenges and who don't have a solution and become very dependent on giving, getting the vaccine. So I think she has a bit of an unusual sample, actually. Upbringing. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. You, you, you develop a mind and brain to fit with that particular situation. And if that particular situation doesn't help, you need to find new solutions. And so uh, trauma and abuse really forces you to find, try to find other solutions, but many of them are not successful. You you, know? No, trauma is a perception in your brain. Trauma, the so the issue is something happens and your brain and mind takes it in and then makes an adaptation to that particular event. That depends on how old you are in the circumstances. And it's very different for different people. If you would beat me up right now, I'd go... This guy is crazy, and I can call people and ruin your reputation, etc. If you're three, if I'm three years old and you start hitting me as a kid, I don't know what the hell to do about it, and I'll likely think it's probably I did something wrong that I caused the guy to beat me up, and I'm a terrible person, and no wonder that he beat me up because I'm a horrible creature, and that's what almost everybody who I know who was beaten as a child, uh, that's the internal understanding of it. 
not when you're eight years old or 15 years old, but when you're very young, that becomes your experience. World. Yeah, yeah. And the, and the, your, your brain creates a map of the world uh, very in very deep ways. And so your experiences form an internal wasser of the world that, that makes you expect certain things at certain times. So if I walk into a room and I see a person who looks like my old uncle who he has to play with, I start sidling up to you because you're on that deep level. You might be of that very nice uncle that I once had. I don't know that, but my brain is set to interpret the world in a particular way. So one of the things, most uh, profound uh, research experiences I had was purely accidental. We started to do Rorschach tests on people, ink blot tests. So you showed some formless ink picture and we showed it to people. And we saw that people had completely different interpretations of what they projected on that ink blot test. And that really brought home to me that we all are li living in different worlds. And that our, like a lot of the Vietnam veterans I saw, saw bloody corpses or mutilated bodies in those cards. People who had never been in combat didn't see that. Uh, rape victims saw torn vaginas and torn bodies. Other people didn't see this. So once that becomes lodged into your perceptual system, you continue to interpret the world in that particular way having to do with what you have gone through in the past. Exactly. As all this, yeah. but it's been analyzed on about 100,000 people over the years. So, so there's certain patterns you can detect in it, yeah. yeah. You know, I learned as much from my ink blood tests as I learned from my brain imaging, uh, but the brain imaging is respectable and in, uh, the mind has sort of disappeared. But uh, for example, in our psychedelic research, I still very much hope to do ink blood tests because as Michael Pollan says, how to change your mind. But we're not measuring how people change their minds. You know, the figures are a quarter of people get physically abused, one out of five people get sexually abused, uh, one out of eight kids witnesses violence being their parents, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, if I sit in a room, you know, it, it's, it's not a binary issue. It's not either you were traumatized or you didn't get traumatized. But uh, when I talk to a room of professionals, which I do a lot, I assume that at least half the group viscerally knows what trauma means. Not necessarily. I can see how uh, your brain may be different from other people's brains. I may take a particular population, you can average it out, and you can say, oh, there's a little more activation of the bariatric to gray, a little bit less of the uh, white insulin. So you see, see certain patterns of uh, connectivity in the brain. But to some degree, you know, uh, I think we, we learn a lot about the brain, but we don't know much about the brain. And I think people tend to overstate how much the brain pictures can teach us. Uh, you know, it's a, I love the Hubble's telescope or the Webb telescope. You know, it's, our brain is like a universe and our technology is very inadequate to really know about all the unbelievably con complex connections in the brain. Is. But we have learned a few things in the last 20 years. It affects the brain that you tend to, you know, there's, there's one part of your brain that I call the cockroach center of your brain, the periacral gray, that lights up, it's sort of underneath the amygdala, everybody knows the word amygdala these days. Okay, um, so the part of your brain that tells you that you're in danger. When you're traumatized, you're likely that that little part of your brain, way back in the, your brainstem, is firing all the time. You, all the time you go like, I'm in danger, I'm in danger, I'm in danger. And so that's where it starts, in a very elementary sensory level. Uh, you don't know what the danger is, but you just feel that uh, you should be scared. And then there's certain um, parts, other parts of your brain, for example, your insula, which makes the connection with your physical sensations and your body awareness that for many people gets shut down because trauma, uh, basically the experience of trauma is a visceral experience of heartbreak and gut wrench. And if you have a lot of that, you can learn to shut that part of your brain down so you don't feel your body so much anymore. I mean, you don't feel your body so much. You don't feel very alive either. 
but you don't feel so scared all the time. But it's likely that you will want to take some drugs to make yourself feel alive sometimes. Um, stuff like that. Yeah. The dysfunction is that it keeps on and, so, and then the amygdala. So, so there's a constant sense of, of subliminal dread. Anxiety is already too high of a mental functioning. Okay. It's more elementary. Huh? It's like your dog shaking. Like, uh, yeah, my daughter has a, adopted a dog. She was a time. And two years later, the dog still is a, walks to my house. Yeah, but still never quite comfortable. Um, um, and that's how many times you meet her, never quite comfortable. Now, trigger is in the higher level thing. Okay. Uh, so then the next level is indeed the trigger that is in part mediated by the amygdala. Is your amygdala, if your smoke detector, that tends to become hypersensitive so that minor things get blown up and a minor thing that you may say to me, I take as the most insulting thing in the world. And so you're constantly triggered by things and that makes, makes you feel like you are doing terrible things to me. And it's not like I'm hypersensitive uh, and when you have an off day, uh, that is your issue and not my issue. No, when you have an off day, I feel your off day and I, uh, we start getting into trouble together. 